In an odd but chilling new case out of Iowa, Todd Mullis is accused of murdering his wife, Amy, with a corn rake. She fell on a fork. I had to put a goddamn fork on her. It, it was very difficult to buy that story. Amy was quite unhappy and was actually thinking about leaving Todd. There were aspects of uh, an, an affair. You believe the last time you saw her that you did have some type of sexual relation. We started watching the first day and I was hooked. Todd Mullis looking at a big penalty if he's convicted. You know, the case kind of took off. It was compelling. He killed Amy. He killed Amy. Now I can understand why. And could not believe that this man was being tried for this. He, he couldn't have killed her. There's a search for what did ancient cultures do to infidelity? Did you do that search? No. 16 facts about cheating women. Did you do that search? No. Todd, did, did you ambush your wife Amy in that shed that day and brutally beat her and chop, chop her up with that corn fork? No, I did not. You know who did. I have no idea. This is what he's going to tell you. I'm going to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, need to find the defendant. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Oh, hello? Uh, where are you at? I'm on the road, I'm out of breath. Okay. A farmer in Iowa, racing to the hospital with his injured wife, Amy, in the back of his pickup truck. Okay, she's not responsive, I'm just, me and my son bring it. Bleeding heavily as she lay in the lap of their teenage son, Tristan. Amy, Amy. Amy. Okay, so what what happened that she's not conscious or breathing? What? She, she fell on a fork. I had to put a goddamn fork on her. It was an old fork sitting in somewhere, and then she was halfway out of the barn. She pulled the picture Amy. out of her. What is your name, sir? Todd Mullis. Todd Mullis and his wife Amy and their three children lived and worked on this farm in Delaware County, Iowa. It was their life. Everything they did revolved around their farm. That's how they made their living, and they had hogs, and they raised hogs, and that was their livelihood. It was on a cold November day, with a dusting of snow on the ground and the crops harvested, that Amy Mullis was discovered unconscious in this red shed on their farm by her son, Tristan. It was reported as a farm accident, and that it was reported that um, Amy had allegedly had fallen onto this corn, the, in, onto a corn rake. It would, it would look kind of like a, a yard rake, only that it had four tines, and the tines were much longer, like eight to ten inches. Can you pull over? I can. Okay, how about you pull over? The 911 operator told Mullis to pull over on the side of the road. Sir, do you feel comfortable uh, doing CPR? I can try, I'll try anything. Okay, pump the truck hard and fast at least twice per second, two inches deep. Twice per second. One, two. One, two. One, two. Now. 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 It did not work. 38-year-old Amy Mullis was pronounced dead at the hospital in nearby Manchester, Iowa, in the same emergency room where she had once worked as a nurse her son Tristan, distraught. Child was covered in blood, uh, I think obviously traumatized from what he had come upon and the fact that uh, his mother was now placed on his lap, bleeding to death. Yeah, she's laying on my son's lap. Is she, is she flat? The whole trauma of just trying to hold her, comfort her while they raced toward the hospital and any help they could get. Farmers are constantly reminded of the potential for accidents on the farm. The very nature of the work presents potential safety hazards 
accidents involving tractors, and these can overturn, falling into grain bins, getting suffocated. In this area, they're, they're very common. But almost immediately, doctors at the hospital where Amy Mullis died began to raise questions that her injuries from a corn rake did not seem consistent with an accident. We were going, this could be an accident, but this could be a homicide. We knew it was something unusual. We needed to find out as much information as we could as soon as possible. The definitive word came from the grisly photos of Amy's back taken at the medical examiner's autopsy, attended by lead investigator, Deputy Travis Hemiseth. Well, there was actually six puncture wounds uh, in Amy's back and it was reported that she had fallen onto a corn rake, which is a four-tine rake. The likelihood of this person falling on a fork and falling on it twice with sufficient force to puncture their body would be uh, totally unlikely. Now, it was a homicide investigation. The corn rake made it almost a quintessential rural Iowa murder. And of course, in such cases, the husband is always the first to be questioned. So at that point, uh, that the investigation primarily was looking at Todd as uh, a, a, more of a person of interest than an actual suspect. But Todd Mullis and his son both said they were in this barn, about 100 yards away from the red shed, before Amy's body was discovered. The, the son said that dad was always within his eyesight. He never lost sight of him. So, had someone sneaked onto the farm and killed Amy? Unfortunately, there were some uh, indiscretions uh, by Amy that would lead investigators to at least think about some other individuals. Indiscretions, it would later emerge, involving at least two extramarital affairs. Amy had had an affair about five years previously. That had broken off. But in 2018, uh, she had begun another affair with um, a fellow who uh, was a farm manager. Her phone revealed text messages from the farm manager named Jerry. Could Jerry or another of Amy's lovers have been the killer? Potentially, yes. Amy's personal life and all her sexual indiscretions, her affairs and her lovers, would soon become the focus of a case that would make headlines around her. Life on a farm can be harsh and unforgiving. A lot of farmers work very hard for what they have. Uh, and I, when I say hard, I mean very hard. And investigators would learn that was true in so many ways on the farm where Todd and Amy Mullis made their home. They had become 21st century versions of the stoic Iowa farm couple in the famed Grant Wood painting, American Gothic, pitchfork and all. Well, just the stoicism, the upright, standing, calm, level stare. That painting isn't actually that far from the truth. And the truth about the marriage of Todd and Amy behind the smiles and family photos was not pretty. It was falling apart. She had felt trapped in the marriage, that she felt almost like a slave in the house. She was very unhappy. He didn't want the marriage to end. He didn't want her to leave. Um, he was, you know, begging her to stay and go to therapy and, and get you know help for their marriage. There was evidence that he was constantly trying to keep tabs on her, borderline stalking type behavior, uh, and maybe not even borderline. Uh, he was keeping very close tabs on her. What we needed to do obviously was talk to Todd, find out what his story was, what, what had happened that day see what he could tell us, uh, what details he could provide as to what happened to Amy and, and why. The questioning was led by John Turbin, an agent with the State Police Division of Criminal Investigation, the DCI. Well, describe you and Amy's relationship to me, Todd. How would you describe it after that, let's say, the last five years? How would you describe your marriage to me? Pretty tight, actually. Yeah. Communication was great. Right? We were together all the time, you know. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, initially he said that uh, they have their ups and downs like any other marriage, but he indicated things were fine. 
but investigators had already learned that that was not true, that there was another ongoing affair with a farm manager by the name of Jerry Frazier. He happened to be a guy who uh, came around and made her feel happy. Amy's phone revealed troubling text to a friend as Todd became suspicious of Jerry Frazier. Amy was, was quite unhappy and was actually thinking about leaving Todd. Investigators learned Amy was actually making preparations to file for divorce and move out. She would have been entitled to a very substantial amount of money had she left him and divorced him. For County Attorney John Bernard, it became the theory of the case, a motive of jealousy and greed. Him having, we believe, learned that she was uh, putting some furniture away, probably thought, she, this is it. If I don't do something, I'm going to lose half the farm, half of what I've worked so hard for. So the jealousy and the greed just kind of combined. But first, investigators had to rule out the possibility that Amy's lover, Jerry Frazier, had not sneaked onto the farm and killed her in his own fit of jealousy and rage. The light dusting of snow on the ground that morning helped. I made note to actually walk around the building to look for any other foot tracks or anything else indicating uh, of anybody else that would have came around the building or into the building. I did not locate anything around. And then investigators pulled the cell phone tower records for Jerry Frazier. And he actually uh, had a, an alibi. He was out of town that day, actually far from town. So now it was up to DCI agent Turbot to see if he could get Todd Mullis to confess. Well, Todd, we've, we've completed our investigation at this point, and the case facts clearly show us that you're responsible for, for Amy's death at this point. Why am I responsible? How? He was pretty much sticking to his original story that she must have fallen on a rake. So Turbot began by working on Todd's emotions, his pride. And you have his farm, and I know that you all that's there, and you're trying to be a good dad in the midst of Amy not really pulling weight in some ways, right? Investigators knew that was true from Todd's own cell phone text to a friend. But then to have this again in 2018, you say, oh man, not again. Not again. Jerry, again. And you had suspicions. And you were right to have suspicions. But Mullis claimed he was unaware of anything going on with his wife since the first affair five years earlier. I didn't hear some of the team having sex with another man in 2008. I didn't. You know what I am, Todd. You were so mad about that. And you felt betrayed again. And you saw there's no facts in front of you. Yeah. And you knew. He knew what was happening, and there was no way, there was no way I thought that you were going to let things go down this way. She was not going to take all that from you. Not cheating on you twice, and then taking you, trying to take your kids, and then trying to take the farm. That wasn't happening. You weren't going to let that happen. And I understand that. But even after two hours of direct accusations, Todd Mullis stuck with his version that he was not in that red shed, did not stab his wife with a cornbread. Do you want to get me to come back to somebody? Yeah, that's all that I'm up to. I'm not telling you, we both know what happened that day. What do you think happened? I mean, I, I just, I just, tried to kill him. He killed him. He killed him. And I can understand why. I think all along we had a pretty good feeling it was this guy. But to the dismay of investigators, the day ended with Todd Mullis, a free man back on his farm. Like the farmer in American Gothic, Todd Mullis gave nothing away. Delaware County is primarily a rural county. About 24 miles by 24 miles. The population is just under 18,000 people. It's a very family-friendly place place where neighbors know everyone and everyone's business, including Todd and Amy's. She was um, a 
vivacious person. She loved helping out on the farm. Uh, he was a, a well-known farmer in the area, I guess a, a, known as a hard worker, successful farm. But some of his neighbors told investigators Todd had a cruel streak. From people that talked to me, Todd was a somewhat scary individual. Um, there were all kinds of stories surrounding things that were done to animals on the farm, uh, things that were done to animals in front of the children. He feels that, you know, people that once were friendly or his friends have turned and uh, turned their backs on him. But with Todd Mullis back on the farm after the interrogation, investigators still were wanting for evidence. Obviously, we have to have all of our evidence collected in, in the, this investigation before we, before we charge. There had been no confession from Mullis during the interrogation as he stuck to his story. I mean, I, I just, I just, I killed him. He killed him. He killed him. Not once did Todd say he didn't do it. Even his 911 call seemed suspicious to them. She fell on a fork. I am it, it was very difficult to buy that story that it was just automatically, this, oh, this is just an accident and we'll get over it. But Todd had what seemed an airtight alibi for that day from his teenage son, Tristan. The biggest obstacle or weakest point we felt was the child. His son told deputies that his father was in this barn, never out of his sight, before his mother was found in the red shed a hundred yards away with the corn rake in her back. The child was always considered sort of a, uh, a dad's boy and uh, really had a strong bond with his father. And while this whole investigation went on, the children were with dad and our concern was that dad would essentially uh, coach the child in a way that would help him. Boy, can you, can you believe mom fell on that rake? Or, you know, do you remember we worked together all day that day? You and I were always within sight of each other. In the interrogation, Agent Turbot even tried to bluff Mullis that Tristan had changed his story. Who knows? Who knows? You guys worked together that whole There was, there was time when, when you and Tristan were not together that morning. I know that now. But you know, I do. Todd, that's done. It's done, Todd. But the bluff did not work. And the farm surveillance cameras, which might have shown Todd's movement in the farmyard, were strangely shut down during the pivotal time frame. There was a specific time frame that actually both cameras, uh, they weren't recording, uh, and then they picked up after the incident. And Todd and his supporters continued to insist it had been an accident, citing Amy's medical condition. She had surgery a few days prior, um, so she wasn't steady on her feet to begin with. And she could have, you know, tripped or gotten dizzy. It could have fallen into her if she would have, you know, been caught off guard or by surprise, it, it could have been a freak farm accident, it happens. But then a tipping point in the case, as investigators carried out a series of search warrants on the Mullis farm. Well, all the, all the electronic devices from the residence um, were seized, uh, computers, laptops, iPads, phones, and we ended up getting uh, Google searches back uh, from uh, Todd's iPad. Google searches for, uh, Topics like uh, what did the Aztecs do with cheating spouses and placement of the organs in the body. It was a prosecutor's dream. 16 facts about cheating women. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Did ancient cultures kill adulterers? Thrill of the kill, killing unfaithful women. Punishment is 18 months for killing cheating wife. The, the content of those Google searches were a key fact to our investigation. The time had come to place Todd Mullis under arrest. I was receiving phone calls from people that knew the family and urging me to use caution when you go arrest Todd. One guy specifically said, you guys take plenty of help with you when you go arrest him. They found him in one of the hog barns. So I'd asked him to step out to, outside to speak with me and when, and when he had, I had told him I had an arrest warrant for uh, for his arrest, and I was placing him under arrest for murder in the first degree. Todd Mullis would be held behind bars for almost seven months before his trial began, 
and he would continue to insist on his innocence and gain a legion of supporters from far beyond Iowa. I thought, well, I'll start a Facebook group, and we're up to over 300 now, and he, he couldn't have killed her. He just, he's not that type of person. Um, he's an honest, hardworking farmer um, who wanted his family to stay together. I, I just don't, I don't believe he did this. And that kind of support and encouragement helped to convince Todd Mullis he should take the stand in his own defense and see if he could persuade the jury of the very same thing. State your name, please. Todd Michael Mullis. By the authority of the state of Iowa, accused Todd Mullis of murder first degree. Opening statements have begun in an odd but chilling new case out of Iowa. Todd Mullis is accused of murdering his wife, Amy, with a corn rake. For sure this is murder. They uh, conceded the fact that this was a murder. I disagree. This is not an accident. A huge national television audience was watching as a family tragedy played out in court. This is a case that had torn two large families, you know, into opposing sides. One side of the gallery was Todd Mullis's family. The other side of the gallery was Amy Mullis's family. Uh, you, could, you could sense the animosity between both sides. And also following the case closely, hundreds of mostly women who would form a Todd Mullis is Innocent Facebook page. You know, started watching the first day and I was hooked. Led by Tracy DeRitter of the New York State. I will admit, I had a little crush at the beginning. Him knowing that people care, number one, and believe that he's innocent is huge for him. Assistant Attorney General Maureen Hughes had just moved to Iowa, and this was her first jury trial in the state. She, she wasn't nervous at all. She seemed capable and assured. We would love for you to get to meet Amy, but you won't. Instead, you will share a courtroom with her killer. And you're going to hear about how Amy was fearful of the defendant, how she told her friends and family members that she was planning on leaving him, but that she was afraid that if he found out she was having an affair, he would kill her. But prosecutors were worried that Todd Mullis would hardly come across like a killer to the jury. He had lost a lot of weight and looked far better than I had ever seen him uh, uh, in the community. So I did have concerns about what the jury might think of him as he sat there uh, at council table during the trial. Good morning, folks. And in his opening statement, Mullis's lawyer, Gerald Firehill, was ready to play the sympathy card, portraying Mullis as a dedicated father and husband. But behind his back, Amy was having a significant sexual affair. And the defense lawyer had also come prepared with a surprise, completely abandoning the contention that Amy's death was due to an accident with a corn rake. Amy Mullis was viciously and deliberately murdered. The issue that you will have to decide in this case is really not who did it, but whether Mr. Mullis did. And with that, Mullis's claims that his wife accidentally fell on the corn rake were out the window. She fell on a fork! I had to put a fork on her! The six holes in her body from a four-tined fork apparently made the death-by-accident defense a non-starter. Folks, Ty Mullis's statements about Amy falling on a fork and dying accidentally was a honest, legitimate, on-the-spot explanation or an attempt to explain what happened to her. It was wrong. She was murdered. Horrible. Among the first day's witnesses, the sheriff's deputy, who retrieved the corn rake from the Mullah shed, dramatically removing it from an evidence bag, its wooden handle broken. Now, deputy, <clears throat> based on your experience and years in law enforcement, would a person be able to inflict, inflict death or serious injury on another person with that corn rake if they chose to do so? Yes, they would. The prosecution's case required them to prove Amy was having an affair, preparing to leave Todd and take the children and 
half of the farm. It's not like losing a business. It's losing your livelihood. It's losing your, your family's place in the world. Witnesses described a real life soap opera. Amy was all upset and she was crying that if her husband Todd would find out that he would kill her. He said, I have worked for this farm since I was 11 and I will not give it up. And I said at that time, he is going to kill you. And why did you say that? Because Todd is just a, the person you don't mess with. State your name and spell it for the record, please leading to the man who was Amy's lover. Jerry Frazier. The prosecution quickly sought to show Frazier was nowhere near the Mullis farm the morning of her death and could not have been the killer. Did you at any point go to the Mullis farm? No. Jerry, on the day of Amy's death, did you communicate with her that morning? Yes. He testified that he emailed Amy that he was sick at home 45 miles away. Amy, from that same account, then responded to you, and what did she write? Says, well, that sucks. Wish I could be there to take care of you. I'm a pretty good nurse. I don't like to see you sick. And in fact, you talked to the police um, shortly after Amy's death. Yes. And you indicated to them that you believe the last time you saw her that you did have some type of sexual relations. It wasn't, yeah. It was not sex. It was oral. So you, you do recall that there was some type of there oral sex? There would have been some of that, yes. Did you and Amy ever have any conversations about what Todd would do if he found out she was having an affair? One time she did say that if he ever found out she would disappear. But the most important witness for the prosecution was Todd Mullis' 13-year-old son, Tristan, who testified from a remote location. He was his father's alibi, first telling police his father was never out of his sight that morning. And you told them at that time that you were with your dad the whole time? Yes. But now, in a few short answers, Tristan changed his story, saying he had left his dad alone to get a drink of water. But what you're telling us today and what you told us at the deposition is that there was a period of time that you were not with your dad. Yes. And as you sit here today, do you know how much time you were away from your dad in that hour and a half in the hog barn? No. It was devastating testimony for the defense. It's from the child's point of view, where was dad? And the child could not say how long dad was out of his sight. Still, given the layout of the farmyard, would there have been enough time for Todd Mullis to have sneaked out of this barn and made his way down to the red shed and killed Amy? without his son seeing him. And it's over a football field's length away from where Amy was found to where they were working in the hog barn. It just would not scientifically have been possible for Todd to get there, do whatever happened, get back for Tristan to see him. It's just impossible. You know, I don't know why he, Tristan would change his story. I, I would think it would be hard for anybody that age to testify, especially against their own parent. Tristan, do you want to be here testifying today? No. Is this a very difficult thing for you to talk about? Yes. And you don't want anything bad to happen to your dad? No. Call Todd Mullis. And it all came down to this. Todd Mullis on the stand in his own defense. He was eager to tell his story, beginning with an effort to undercut the impact of his son's testimony. Do you have an estimate of how, how many minutes or seconds he would have been out of the main part of the barn getting the drink before he returned? As a matter of seconds. While he was doing that, did you ever leave the barn? No, I did not. Earlier, the jury saw the interrogation of Mullis, with the agent testifying that he never denied killing Amy. And the case I clearly show us that you're responsible for her own death at this point. I am responsible. How? This DCI agent this morning said that, in his opinion, you never denied killing Amy. Do you think you did? Yes, I did. And 
and you did so, how? I stated that you want me to confess to something I did not do. God, you know, you won't get me to confess to something I didn't do. That's all I know to do. In my mind, that's saying, I did not do that. Was he giving you much of a chance to explain things? Not at all. I tried several times, and he wouldn't give me a chance to say two words. What do you think? I mean, I, I just, I just, I don't know. He killed Amy. He killed Amy. And I can understand why. Todd, did, did you ambush your wife Amy in that shed that day and brutally beat her and chop, chop her up with that corn fork? No, I did not. Do you know who did? I have no idea. No other questions. But there would be plenty of questions for Todd Mullis a cross-examination the next morning, including a surprise development overnight about what was on that 911 call. Okay, Mr. Mullis, do you want to come back up and retake the stand for cross-examination, please? Todd Mullis was in for a rough day. The internet searches found on his iPad a major theme. Dean, there's a search for characteristics of cheating women. Did you do that search? No. Okay. Do you know who did that search? No. You have no idea? No. Around that same date, there's a search for what did ancient cultures do to infidelity? Did you do that search? No. Again, you, don't, you have no idea who did that search? No. There's a search on here that same date, um, 16 facts about cheating women. Did you do that search? No. All around the time that his wife Amy had begun her affair with Jerry Frazier. And right after that, killing unfaithful women. Did you do that search? No. And the last one of that bunch is a visited site. Punishment is 18 months for killing cheating wife. Did you do that one? No. Do you know who did it? No. Worse was about to come from an unlikely source, someone watching the trial live on television. Because this was broadcast around the country, we were getting emails and phone calls from attorneys and citizens and, uh, you know, essentially uh, people who are trying to play private eye or investigator uh, calling and saying, did you see this? Did you see that? Someone had taken the time to analyze Todd Mullis's 911 call. Well, it was just ha it just happened to be a person calling in saying, you really need to listen to that 911 tape because I believe he is saying something under his breath. As Todd Mullis is performing CPR on his wife, <laughs> The tipster said he could hear him saying, cheating whore. <laughs> and a few seconds later, go to hell, cheating whore. <laughs> Investigators had never heard that until they got the tip from a viewer the night before the last day of the trial. And depending on the device you were listening on, uh, you could hear it very clearly, we thought. In, in my mind, it clearly said what it said. The prosecutor walked Mullis into her trap. No, John, did you just hear that whisper at the end of that? Yes. And what did you whisper? I couldn't hear it. Okay, I'm gonna play it again. Do you whisper cheating whore right there? No. So you don't remember what you whispered? No. Okay, I'm gonna play another clip for you. <laughs> just try to listen really closely. I just wanna know if you remember what you said. <laughs> Right there, do you say, go to hell, cheating whore? No. So you don't hear that? 
No. You didn't hear at 653, cheating whore. You didn't hear that. I didn't hear that word. And it's right at that, after you hear a ping, you don't hear go to hell, cheating whore. No. I have nothing for the judge. Mullis' Facebook supporters were outraged. I think it was a cheap shot by the prosecutor, but I don't believe, you know, I heard cheating whore. Um, I just didn't hear that. That's, I didn't hear that. I heard four, and he was breathing heavily. He was giving CPR. I didn't hear what what the prosecution claims. The defense uh, countered that Todd was actually under his breath, mumbling, so cold, she's so cold. Uh, I've heard that audio a dozen times and I'm still unable to really hear exactly what it says. But the question was, what would the jury hear? <laughs> Okay, whenever the state is ready for closing argument, Ms. Hughes, you can go ahead. Amy Mullis didn't stand a chance. She was unarmed and unaware that she was about to be ambushed by the very man that took a vow to love and honor her. And Prosecutor Maureen Hughes made the whispers on the 911 tape a centerpiece of her closing argument. And I'm going to implore you to listen to that 911 call. Don't take my word for it. Don't believe me. Listen to it for yourself. Make your own determination. Why did he kill Amy? Because he didn't want to lose his farm? Because she was cheating? You might not like that Amy was having an affair, but that doesn't mean she deserved to die. Today, this nightmare finally ends. It finally ends for Amy and for her friends and family, for her children, because Amy finally gets the justice she deserves. Today is the day you find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Mr. Firehelm, whenever you're ready. Please, the court. Counsel. Is it possible that somebody could have went in that shed and been in there and, and Amy surprised him. I know that sounds like a murder mystery, but could it? Whatever happened in there was sudden and violent. Mullis's lawyers scoffed at the prosecution's interpretation of the 911 tape. If you listen carefully, he's out of breath. He's, he's, he's doing compressions. He says, she's cold, she's cold. It just boggles the mind that you would be on 911 saying that. If you murdered your wife and you're, you're whispering, cheat your, uh, go to hell, you, you're gonna do it on a 911 call? He's panicking, <sighs> she's cold. Listen. That is a Hail Mary by the state here, folks. And finally, back to the fundamental question of the devoted farmer and his pitchfork. Common sense. Is that man diabolical enough to not only murder his wife with that thing, but to send his 13-year-old kid to find her? Is, is that guy, did he do that? Does he present that type of Horrible, horrible, evil. You saw him, you, you, you get to judge him. The prosecutors expected a quick verdict. Frankly, I think it was a slam dunk. But the jury took more than two days to make its judgment. I was thinking perhaps it would be a hung jury. Then we got the word to return to the courthouse and the place filled up again. An even bigger audience watched the live broadcast as the verdict was announced. Todd Mullis looking at a big penalty if he's convicted. I thought there's no way that they can find him guilty. I mean, he did great on the stand, um, but I was concerned about that 911 call. This is unquestionably an emotional case for both parties. 
When the verdict is read, I expect there to be no outbursts, uh, no disruptions of court of any kind. Would the foreperson please hand the verdict to the court attendant? We, the jury, find the defendant, Todd Michael Mullis, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree, signed by the jury foreperson. Um, the look on his face broke my heart. He was crushed. Um, it, it, it's such an injustice. There were a lot of tears on the side of the courtroom that had Amy Mullis's family. Hugs and tears and a lot of emotion was shown. Todd Mullis's sentencing was delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And he used that time to hire a new lawyer who said Mullis should get a new trial because of what he claimed was misconduct on the part of prosecutors for raising the supposed hidden whispers on the 911 tape. And the, the fact of the matter is that uh, none of those statements were contained on that tape. So in looking at uh, this, Your Honor, uh, the question is, did Ms. Hughes intentionally, recklessly, and repeatedly use prejudicial terminology while she knew or reasonably should have known uh, this phrase was not in the recording that was played. But the judge refused to throw out the guilty verdict and gave Mullis one last chance to speak. This is the only chance you'll get to speak today before I present, uh, before, before I pronounce judgment. Is there anything you would like to say today? I did not do this. Uh, this is supposed to be America where you have a, a fair chance of proving your innocence. But you shouldn't have to prove your innocence. Innocent until proven guilty. I feel this is the other way around. And I was a faithful and loving husband, and I never did this. And the sentence, mandatory in a case of first degree murder. For the charge of murder in the first degree, you are sentenced to life in prison with no opportunity for parole. Yeah, there's, there's nothing good that came out of this. I mean, there's, it's a tragedy. The children losing essentially both parents, with one dead and the other going to prison. Oh, it's very sad. It's a very, very sad case. I would be fine if we don't have any more homicides, but it's a strange world out there. Anything can happen. It's rugged country. It's very, it's some of the ruggedest country in North America. My son's name is Dylan Redwine, yes. And his dad texted me a little while ago and said he could not find Dylan. You know in the back of your mind that it's not going to end good. Bring Dylan home! Bring Dylan home! If you show us today, show where he's at today, I guarantee you, I'll cut you loose. But Tom, I can't help you with that because I don't know where Dylan's at. I want everybody to know how much I love that boy. I want you to do something to find Dylan. I don't like you, I hate you, and you have been nothing of a father. I was horrified. The pictures are, you know, of Mark in women's clothing. Are the photos genuine? No, they are not. When I laid eyes on that skull, I just, I knew in my heart it was Dylan. He uh, was, I think, shocked and surprised. He thought he was off the hook. I felt it was about damn time. Do you love your father? I still love him. I, I, I wish I didn't have to be here. This is what he's going to tell me. I'm going to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, need to find the defendant.
Fire Dispatch. Hi, my name is Elaine Redwine, and um, my son Dylan Redwine was visiting his dad up in Durango, and his dad texted me a little while ago and said he could not find Dylan. Okay. Dylan is thir 13 years old. Okay, so he's staying with his dad. And what's the dad's name? Mark. Mark Redwine. Um, does he have any idea where he may have gone? Uh, and not according to him, no. And I was very scared for my son. I mean, my son wasn't even there for 24 hours and he's missing? I mean, that doesn't happen. I just got in my car and had to go to Durango because I live six hours away and try and find my son. It's rugged country. It's very, it's some of the ruggedest country in North America. And my concern was the, the, the weather for the, that night was supposed to go below freezing. I wound up b being out till 12.30, 1 o'clock that night. And th one of the notable f things that I saw is that uh, Mark never came out, never talked to me. And he wound up turning all the lights off in his house and, like he went to bed, which is very unusual. Usually somebody would light up the house like a beacon. So what we'll do is uh, we'll give you up. Within days, hundreds of people had volunteered to help search for Dylan Redwine. Some people for the terrain up the hill, some for between the lake and the road. Dylan's father, Mark, pushed for the search to center on the area around a mountain lake dam about seven miles away. He described Dylan as a big fisherman that he loved to go fishing all the time. He said that um, he couldn't find his fishing pole and that the fishing pole was missing and that he liked to go fishing down by the dam. And we're walking along the edges of this road, trying to find possibly Dylan's backpack. Volunteer Kathy Berry recorded the search around the dam for a Facebook page dedicated to Dylan. The terrain was really steep. Um, the road along the lake, it just drops straight down on the side and goes down into the water, down onto the bank. Dylan's mom is in front of me, and she's doing pretty good. She's holding it together pretty good. And you always fear the worst because he's not there, but we always tried to keep hope because I felt if I lost hope, you know, then everybody else would as well. Um, but you know, as a mom, you know in the back of your mind that it's not gonna end good. And you guys are friends of Dylan's, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. And Ryan, you were the last person to talk to Dylan on Sunday night, right? Yes. And so tell me what was going on. You guys were just texting and... Yeah. Uh, he sounded really excited to come over. He was actually supposed to stay the night, but decided not to for some reason. I don't know why. And then we decided that he would just come over at 6.30 in the morning. That's just what he asked. And I, I said that was fine. And so I set an alarm and... I woke up in time and he never showed up. So anything else you guys want to say about your friend Dylan? Hope he comes home soon. Yeah, hope he comes home soon. People would come out, ask what they could do. Did you check here? Did you check here? Where a kid might be? Nothing. Loving God, we pray first and most of all for Dylan. We know that you are aware of where he is and what his needs are. And so we pray for him now. When I think of the word Dylan, the first thing that comes to my mind is perfect. And for this to happen to him is just horrible because he doesn't deserve it. Dylan's father, Mark, spoke about his son in the past tense. I want everybody to know how much I love that boy and how much I cared about him. He was such a wonderful boy. He meant everything. And unfortunately, his mom and I don't see eye to eye on things. And I wish that could change. I asked him, I said, did you and Dylan get into a fight? And he said, no. And I said, well, Dylan wouldn't just leave or run away without either texting me or Corey. The first thing I told Mark, you know, is this is your responsibility, and we gotta, we gotta find him. Um, what'd you do with Dylan? 
Soon, sheriff's deputies and the FBI were asking Mark Redwine the same question, and the family blame game escalated. Obviously, it's no secret that I, I believe that Lane could be involved in this. You know, I don't know how she would do it. I don't know who else she would have involved with it. But I can't help but think that there's a possibility that she had some involvement with this. He had some really bad answers at the end of the first interview uh, because he blamed Elaine, uh, Dylan's mom, for his dis for Dylan's disappearance and said it's probably her fault. And he thought that Dylan had just run away because of problems with Elaine. Dylan had flown into Durango to spend the Thanksgiving week with his father as part of a court-ordered visitation. He did not want to go. I mean, he was okay going um, because he wanted to see his friends in that area. But my mom was pretty sick with cancer, and we knew it would probably be her last Thanksgiving, and Dylan really wanted to spend it with my mom. I called my lawyer and, you know, said, what can I do? And she said, really nothing. It's a court order. You know, you really need to put him on the plane. It did not appear that this was a happy reunion. Um, even in the airport, when Dylan first got off the plane, there was no smiles, there were no hugs. The first stop was a Walmart to buy some movie DVDs. You know, in the cameras in the Walmart, Dylan and Mark are not together, shopping together. Dylan is texting the friend he had wanted to spend the night with, Ryan. So Dylan's already asserting himself to say he's there on a mandated visit, but he doesn't want to spend time with Dad. The last time Dylan was seen alive was after he and his father left the Walmart, stopped for a hamburger, and headed to Mark's home. Uh, as Mark describes it, they're not real warm towards each other at first, but they start roughhousing. You know, I asked a couple times, was, was anybody hurt in this thing? And no, no, nobody's hurt. At 9.46 that night, Dylan's phone stopped working. Two months after Dylan disappeared, his mother Elaine and brother Corey joined a protest outside Mark Redwine's home. Our buddy, our heart. Where is Dylan? Our buddy, our heart. Corey's getting ready to do another interview. Well, right now, you know, um, he was the last person to see him, and he's not, you know, helping out with, you know, um, giving us answers that we have questions to. And so until we can put all of the attention back on Dylan. We got to get it off the last person to see Dylan. And right now, I'm, he's making it as hard as he can to get the attention off of him. There's still a lot of doubt in me that he didn't have anything to do with it. Do you think he did have something to do with it? I do. With the FBI's help, sheriff's deputies carried out a search warrant on Mark Redwine's house. His eyes were bloodshot, but it didn't seem like he was crying. To me, it looks staged, uh, as like he was looking like he was emotional. The cadaver dogs uh, alerted to human remains, um, the odor of human re remains within Mark's, Mark Redwine's house and the back of his uh, pickup. We knew something had likely happened in the house. When he said the rough housing, no one was hurt, our thoughts were something else had happened and that the rough housing was explaining something else. And, and to move forward was to take the polygraph. And Sheriff's investigator Tom Cowing pressed Redwine to come clean after delivering the results of a lie detector test. You've taken it once, Elaine took it once, she passed it and you failed it. He was found to be deceptive, uh, specifically to the question of do you know where Dylan Redwine is? And he failed miserably. If you lead us to him, I absolutely guarantee you that I would not arrest you today. If you told me where Dylan is today, and you take me to Dylan, show me where he's at, and we'll drop you back off at your car at your house, and we get Dylan back. And you go on with your life. Because what's more important is we want him back home. I want that. 
If you show us today, show, show where he's at today, just bring us there. I guarantee you, I'll cut you loose. I'm not going to arrest you today. But Tom, I can't help you with that because I don't know where Dylan's at. And I think you do. I know you do. If he fell down accidentally and hurt himself and you freaked out and panicked and you put him somewhere. You know, um, it's, it's better to get in, in front of this than to have somebody down the road find him and then, oh, shit. What do we do now? Well, he's in a shallow grave. This doesn't look good. Last seen by dad. Or you could just tell us where he's at and work work with us and we'll deal with all the, the other stuff later. I'm not gonna sit here and admit to you that I've done something that didn't happen, that I didn't do. And if that's what you're waiting on, then we're gonna be waiting a long time for that. I got all the time in the world. I just, when's enough? Enough? When, when, I mean, when's it gonna be too much for you to hide? And Mark Redwine had a lot to hide, as investigators would learn from his other son, Corey. We were in Cleveland. We were on a, a trip with Mark. Um, we were, you know, went to, I believe, a baseball game that day. Mark was asleep. Late at night in the hotel room, Dylan had borrowed his father's computer. Corey, Corey, come here. I got to show you these pictures. We came across a deleted file. Um, it showed all the pictures that had recently been deleted. I was horrified. The pictures are, you know, of Mark in women's clothing. You know, I think he's got a red shirt on, um, wearing women's pantyhose and underwear, um, you know, and relieves himself in his diaper and you know he cleans it you know with his mouth and that's when I pulled out my cell phone um, and just took a few few pictures of, of what was on the laptop it's a place my mind never dreamed of you know going let alone seeing it you know in my own father you know so um, it you know it, it's it's a terrible thing I'll have in my mind forever. I told Dylan after we, we saw the pictures, you know, you, we got to keep this between me and you. I didn't want Mark knowing that we had those pictures and we knew about it. But 13-year-old Dylan, as sweet as everyone said he was, never held back if something bothered him. He didn't like to be quieted, so if he... If he felt a certain way, he would make sure that you knew how he felt. He was just honest and to the point. They had gotten into an argument about me and my mom being a good example for Dylan, and Dylan wanted those pictures to show Mark, you know, what we had seen him as. I could feel the frustration and the the fire through, you know, of in Dylan. Um, so I knew he was really upset, and I ended up sending those pictures to Mark after Dylan had asked for him. I wish I wouldn't have sent them at all. That's that's Dylan trying to get some power so he can go up against Dad, like he had seen his older brother do. And so we believe that's what happened. And Dylan has that that, uh, as he would call, weapon against Mark, uh, and it's a pretty good one. Ready, three, take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. But with Dylan still missing, Mark's secret was about to become very public and become a key part of the investigation as a likely motive. Elaine, Corey, and Mark Redwine all agreed to appear on the Dr. Phil show, holding nothing back. I don't like you, I hate you, and you have been nothing of a father. I want you to do something to find Dylan. Dylan is everything to me. My whole world evolves around Dylan. Are the photos genuine? No, they are not. 
So that's not you in the photos? No, I'm not arguing that it's my face in the photos. What I'm arguing is the fact that they were fabricated because it was actually, I believe that Elaine and Corey were coming into my house and rummaging through my things and going through my personal belongings when I traveled out of town. I came up with a scheme that had to be so outrageous that they could not, not talk about it. And that's exactly what I got out of that. Did I in ever intend to be sitting here on your show having this conversation with you? or them? Absolutely not. So you're saying they broke into your house and fabricated these pictures? No, 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 no. I fabricated the pictures and left them available. I never let on to anyone, but I think that's when I knew that Dylan was no longer alive. Just by Mark's remarks and his body language and his actions, um, it made me fear the worst. This is a really serious, serious matter. Among the millions of people who watch the Redwine family on Dr. Phil's program. Thank you for being here today. So long. Were the authorities back in Colorado who obtained the videos as possible evidence. It brought Mark forward um, and, and put him um, at the center of, uh, of the controversy. So what were your thoughts on that whole thing? I think it was a public format for Elaine and Corey to publicly accuse me of doing something with Dylan. And I, I expected too much from Dr. Phil. The Dr. Phil show resulted in hundreds of leads and tips, but none panned out. I mean, everything leads back to you, Mark. I mean, we have systematically ruled out a ton of people. You say, Everything that you do in life is, is for Dylan. Everything you want it to be right for Dylan. Just take us to him and cut you loose. That's what I want to. I know to you it probably doesn't seem that way, but... Actions speak louder than words, Mark. I don't think you're a, a, a guy who has a mean bone in his body that would purposely do something like that. But, you know, if it was an accident, um, you know, we can work with that. You can't undo something that has gone horribly wrong, but you can make amends for something that you did wrong. You can always ask for forgiveness. All right, well, I'll take that all into consideration. They didn't have that smoking gun. There was not enough information. We didn't, you know, you don't go forward on a criminal investigation with no body. And I think it was very difficult for people to believe that a father could kill his son. You know, I mean, fathers don't just kill their sons. The winter weather had shut down much of the search effort for Dylan. Once snow hits the high country, you, you, you can't get up there. Nothing, nothing all winter. Especially on Middle Mountain where we wanted to search, they closed the mountain in the winter. So you can't even get up there. But once the snow melted, the searchers were finally able to access the Middle Mountain area. Um, my stepfather caught him up on the mountain early one morning. And I got the call that uh, Mark was just sighted coming off Middle Mountain Road. And that's what turned our attention to Middle Mountain Road. Uh, 35 handlers, dog handlers, numerous dogs we had. ATV searchers, we had horseback searchers, we had uh, rappelling teams come in. It was a, a four-day search. Uh, it was um, during that search that a Nike Air Jordan size 7 youth was found. That was the breakthrough. The shoe appearing to match the one Dylan was seen wearing in the Walmart surveillance video. Uh, the next day, uh, we had the, the search dogs, the human remain dogs in that area. They, uh, one dog alerted on two bones. While those two bones were being collected, I looked down and found a long bone. The bones were Dylan's. This is investigator Tanya Galbright. This is a phone call to Mark Redwine. Mark. Hey Mark, it's Tanya. Hi, how are you? 
I'm wonderful. How are you? Oh, I'm f***ing living the dr f***ing dream. The f***ing dream. Are you intoxicated, Mark? Nope, not at all. Okay, then why are you talking to me like that? Because, because you can't seem to think no deeper than the surface. Uh, he told me to pull my head out of the sociopath's ass and that women are only good for one thing and it's not cooking and cleaning. Because I'll be honest with you, Tanya, I don't think you're capable of handling a situation. Really? Like don't that. you think it's pretty amazing we found any remains up on Middle Mountain? In the middle of nowhere? Yeah, you no. Know, Two percent of Dylan's remains does not constitute him being found, so you know what? Yes, it does. He's dead. We know that now. If we hadn't gone up there and looked, we wouldn't have known that. So two percent of Dylan's remains constitutes him being found. I'd like to find the rest of him, but yes, oh, we know, you know what, what happened. We know he's you know no what? longer with us. But there was still no skull, no cranium which would likely hold the clues to Dylan's cause of death. Mark made a comment to me several times about how there had only been 2% of Dylan's remains found, so they can never prove he was murdered. But other bits and pieces of the investigative puzzle began to fall into place. Mark said that he, when he was moving his four-wheeler out of the garage, uh, he found the fishing pole in the garage, uh, which is impossible. It had been searched and photographed, and I don't know where it came from, but it was back. The futile search around the lake and the dam had all been based on the supposedly missing fishing pole. The fact that he had tried to use this ploy uh, and then was foolish enough to say that he had found it, you know, just indicated that he was being very dishonest with law enforcement. And then in 2015, almost three years after Dylan disappeared, hikers found a skull about a mile away, six miles by road from where the other bones had been located. When I laid eyes on that skull, I just, I knew in my heart it was Dylan. There was no question, I had no question about it and that was in 15, I thought, okay, now we're gonna move forward. And again, we still didn't move forward. Um, so in 2017, a lot of stuff changed in La Plata County. The election that year brought a new district attorney, Christian Champagne, who had been working on the case as a deputy district attorney. The new DA just pressed forward and said, you know, we're gonna get a grand jury and let's see what a grand jury says. And I just told them to stick with us. It was going to be a long road. It was going to take a while, but that we were going to get to justice for Dylan. The grand jury returned an indictment of red wine for second degree murder and child abuse. Just keep your hands up. Don't move, by, okay? Mark was in Washington State working as a trucker when the indictment came down. Do not move. He uh, was, I think, shocked and surprised. Uh, a warrant for murder second for you. I'm sorry? I have no idea what that's about. He had become pretty confident that we were never going to bring charges against him, that we had never developed any evidence against him. So he thought he was off the hook. I felt it was about damn time. We are live in Colorado where the case is about to proceed against Mark Redwine in the second degree murder case and the death of his 13-year-old son, Dylan. Redwine did not face the more serious first degree murder charge, which carries a mandatory life sentence. Here in Colorado, first degree murder requires plan or premeditation ahead of time. We did not have evidence that he plotted to, to kill Dylan. Uh, so second degree murder and child abuse resulting in death were the right charges for our case. It had been almost nine years since Dylan had disappeared, but for his mother, Elaine, it seemed like yesterday. Spend a couple minutes telling the jury about Dylan, okay? Dylan was sweet, he was funny, um, he was charismatic, he was um, very empathetic, he really cared about people and their feelings. Um, very sweet, sweet boy. And as well. 
There's tissues to the left if you need them. You have water with you. See Mark red wine in the courtroom here today. Yes. He's wearing a blue shirt and gray suit. There was plenty of eye contact and I am not afraid of him anymore. And so I refuse to look away. So I'm showing you what's been previously made into evidence of people's one, two, and three. Can you take a look at those, please? I've seen those a million times. What are those? <laughs> They're pictures of Dylan, his friend, Adam and Joe. Taken the day before he left to visit his father. Do you any injuries, sores, or cuts to his face or lips? No. And then her final unanswered text messages to Dylan. How's it going, son? Are you okay? All right, uh, Ms. Hall, I know this is, I can only imagine how hard this is. I'm really sorry. Thank you. In the final text message in this exhibit, what do you say in that text message, Ms. Hall? I said, Dylan, please be safe. Mom is here to come get you, son. Elaine had been unrelenting in her efforts to point a finger of blame at her ex-husband. You were the last person to see Dylan. That's been confirmed. And that became a defense line of attack on cross-examination. I've always said that I believe that he had a hand in Dylan's disappearance, yes. Okay, and you've told that to a lot of people. Okay, sure. I mean... You don't have to go anymore. They know your answer. You've gone on national television and iterated that opinion, correct? Yes. And you've iterated that opinion to law enforcement, correct? Yes. And you've iterated that opinion to um, Facebook platforms, correct? Yes. Do you recall making any comments on the Facebook page, arrest Mark Redwine? No. Do you recall making any comments on arrest in prison, Mark Redwine Facebook page? No. You know, you're talking about the grieving mother uh, of, of a lost child, a murdered child, uh, and to try to attack her and trash her character um, and say that she was, you know, making this uh, about a vendetta or revenge against Mark, I think really fell flat. Now the jurors were about to see the compromising photos of Mark Redwine. And we showed them for a very specific and limited purpose, which is to show that there was conflict and a potential motive um, for, for Mark to lash out against Dylan, um, for Dylan to have confronted his father with these photographs, and that that would have been an example of uh, some of the conflict that could have led to Mark lashing out. Could you please start by introducing yourself to the jury by your full name, Corey Allen Redwine? Is there a point in time when Dylan used the defendant's computer? Yes. Did he find something on the computer? Yes. Can you explain to the jury what he found? Um, he found pictures of Mark dressed in women's clothing, um, wearing a diaper, um, taking selfies of him, wearing the clothing, um, wearing the diaper, um, eating the feces that was in the diaper, um, and uh, just, that's pretty much it. How did he react to seeing those photographs of his father? Um, he was pretty disgusted. Dylan lost uh, uh, um, any reasons for him to look up to, to Mark that day. And then prosecutors showed the jury a clip from the Dr. Phil show. You're saying they broke into your house and fabricated these pictures? No, 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 no. I fabricated the pictures and left them available. So is there any reason back then for him to plant photos like that for you or for Dylan? No. Do you love your father? Yes. Do you wish you were here under different circumstances seeing your father? Yes. To this very day, how do you feel about him? I still love him. I... I wish I didn't have to be here.
Not all jurors would believe that's a motive for murder, a motive to kill your own child if they see a picture of you cross-dressing on a computer. That is going to be a hard sell if, well, if that were all there was. And the jury wants to see hard evidence that this man killed his son. So the prosecution actually recreated Mark Redwine's living room in a courtroom down the hall and brought the jury in. They could see the layout, they could see the distances, uh, and they could see the actual pieces of evidence um, with their own eyes. There was blood on the couches, there was blood on the floor, there was blood on the coffee table. And at least one of the deposits was 100% Dylan Redwine's blood. That was probably some of our strongest evidence. And that area was right in here for this day. But Dylan was a frequent visitor to his father's home, and the prosecution witnesses could not say when the blood had been left there, or that it meant a crime had been committed. Having been to over 1,000 crime scenes, you know how to find evidence of violent struggles and fight, correct? If it's present, yes. And in your initial walkthrough, I want to focus your attention on that, you didn't find any evidence of a violent struggle or a fight or bloodletting event in your initial walkthrough, correct? That is correct. This is a model of a human skull. The final days of the trial focused on who or what killed Dylan Redwine. The significance is that I believe that this is associated with blunt trauma. But the defense focused on the fact the skull was found in an area where bears and mountain lions roam freely. It obviously, some sort of sizable animal bit left puncture marks on that part of the cranium. Coyote, fox, bear, mountain lion. Um, yes. You can't rule out that this fracture comes from either a bear getting really after the, the cranium and biting down on it and crunching on it. Right. So we knew that they wanted to make that the center of their case and the center of their attack on us. And that an animal or something caused in nature could have been responsible for the fractures on the skull. You know, we have bear, we have mountain lion, uh, but the, generally they don't move their prey more than about a quarter of a mile. Dylan's skull was found more than a mile away from his other remains. It's possible that a bear could carry a skull that far too physically, right? Yes. And it's possible that a mountain lion could carry a skull that far physically, right? Uh, physically, yes. Have you ever seen anything like that in your career? Uh, bears and lions, no. They were never able to put together the pieces to make a plausible argument about how Dylan would have gotten up on this mountainside uh, in shorts and a t-shirt, um, and been attacked by wild animals uh, in, in the middle of November. It just, didn't, it just didn't make sense. All eyes now were on Mark Redwine to see his reaction, to see if he would testify. The jurors, they're watching the defendant very, very closely to see what his reactions look like, to watch him as the witnesses are talking about Dylan's murder, Dylan's remains. I mean, a normal father that lost a son would have completely fallen to pieces. And he never even reacted at all. He never shed a tear. Redwine opted not to testify. At its core, this is a simple and tragic case a damaged and deteriorating relationship that turned deadly on November 18th, 2012. We know Dylan knows about the poop pics, as he calls them. I could show them to you, but you remember them, ladies and gentlemen. Think about the impact they had on his 13-year-old son. Do you think it would have taken much for Dylan to use them in November to bring them up, to talk about them? We know that Dylan's murder was not caused by an accident we know Dylan's murder was not caused by a bear because of all the evidence that comes before and everything that he did after. And all it took was a spark to this man to end Dylan's life, ladies and gentlemen. When you're ready, Mr. Bogan. May it please the court. 
Red Wine's lawyer, Justin Bogan, delivered the defense closing arguments. We stand shoulder to shoulder, Mr. Mark Red Wine, because it's our honor to stand with someone who's wrongly accused. And the evidence is so thin, and the emotions are so high. So we know the government case is based on the pictures. They introduce the pictures as evidence. They want you to believe that these pictures will provide some enlightenment to you about the motive that they ascribe to Mr. Redwine for killing his youngest son, whom he loved. Do not fall for that. The prosecution likes these pictures a lot more than they like the tangible and scientific evidence in this case. They like those pictures more than they like the fact that uncontested damage by animals to the remains the marks on the cranium are consistent with animal damage. They are creating this narrative about rage and anger and photos and deteriorating relationship. And they want you to latch on to this story <laughs> because the actual physical evidence in the case does not support that Mark Redwine killed his son. The trial had lasted for five weeks. The jury returned its verdict in six hours. Mr. Redwine, if you please stand up. Jury verdict count number one, murder in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count number one. Be quiet, please. Count number two, child abuse. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count two, child abuse. He knows what he did. He knows. I think he deserves to die. I mean, his son died, and I think he needs an equally horrible death. But there is no death penalty in Colorado, and the sentence for second-degree murder ranges from 16 to 48 years. People would bring forward Elaine Hall. I'm really nervous, so it's okay. bear with me. Dylan was 13 years old when he took his life. When I think about what happened that night, it breaks my heart to think about Dylan looking up at his dad knowing he's the killer. He is my killer. It breaks my heart. And I wonder, what were you thinking then when you saw his big old blue eyes? I, I, I mean, I don't even think that it phased you. I'm just glad that we are free from you and that you will not be free to hurt us anymore. Thank you, Your Honor. Mark may have physically taken him, and I can't change that. But what I can do is tell the world how a 13-year-old young man stood up to his then 50-year-old father and said all the things I regret never saying. Dylan is my hero and became more of a man in 13 years than Mark has in 60. Do you wish to tell me anything before sentencing? No, Your Honor, I do not. But Redwine had expressed his thoughts on the trial in a statement to the probation office. You wrote the following, and this is a quote from what you wrote. Innocent of all charges, miscarriage of justice, fake conviction, sham trial. I have trouble remembering a convicted criminal defendant that has shown such an utter lack of remorse for his criminal behavior community needs to be uh, protected from you. We need to be removed from society for a long period of time. I'm going to sentence you to 48 years on both counts with five years of parole. They are to be served concurrently. Deputy Robinson, take the defendant back to jail. Thank you. I don't think closure is a real part of losing somebody personally. I can't move on from my son. I can't just close the chapter and pretend he never existed. So, I mean, I'll always be sad. I'll always mourn his death. Um, and I'll always celebrate his life.
she and her family never gave up on trying to get justice for Dylan. Hey, Dylan. Oh. You know, thank you for coming out. Just in Colorado alone, there's 1,500 cold cases that have gone unsolved. And so the message that I want to send to those families, to those law enforcement officers that are working on these cases, and to the prosecutors that are considering whether to come forward into court and bring these charges, is to keep fighting and never give up.